The last 36 hours have been some of the most dramatic in the conflict in Ukraine, um, pointing, I think, to a decisive uh, breakdown in the Ukrainian military, its inability to continue to hold positions along the contact line, and to perhaps the first definite indications that we're seeing a overall crumbling of Ukrainian defences, not just um, in particular locations, but right across the contact line. Now, I'm going to, because of these very dramatic developments, I'm going to start with a quick rundown of what's happening on the line of contact. But um, in anticipation of that, the first thing I will juxtapose into connect in relation to this is some discussion of two big Russian airstrikes that were carried out on two airfields in northern Ukraine, northwestern Ukraine. The one indeed Mirnogrod, exactly the one that I thought it was uh, when I discussed this attack, this, this strike uh, yesterday. The other Poltava, uh, another airfield Poltava, located even closer to the combat lines in some respects than uh, Mirnogrod. Um, this um, airfield in northern Kharkiv region immediately to the west of Kharkiv city. And the Russian Defense Ministry has provided dramatic news about the results of these airstrikes. Now, I'm going to begin with the airstrike on Mirnograd, which was, as I said, a um, astonishing event. Um, and this is what the Russian Defense Ministry says. It says nine Ukrainian Air Force aircraft were hit over the past 24 hours. A combined strike by precision weapons against an airfield, and this is clearly the one in Mirnograd, destroyed five and damaged two Suhoi 27 aircraft of the enemy's air force. Another two Ukrainian MiG-29 and Suhoi 24, 27 aircraft were shot down by Russian air defenses. So that was the missile strike on Mirnograd Air Base that I discussed before. The Russians say that over the course of that uh, strike, five Suhoi 27s and, uh, were destroyed and two other Suhoi 27s were damaged. And they provided film of this attack um, on that particular day, uh, that particular airstrike. And, well, I'm not in myself able to verify exactly what the Russian claims are, but I understand that a Ukrainian official has spoken to the Western media anonymously and confirmed the missile strike on the base at Mirnograd and has confirmed that the Ukrainians did indeed suffer losses, though he claims that the Russians are inflating the losses that they claim to have inflicted on the Ukrainians. Um, on these sort of attacks, I have to say that I tend to go with what the Russians say. So, according to the Russians, in the airstrike on the airfield, five Sukhoi 27s, this is Ukraine's top of the line fighter, um, were destroyed and two others were damaged. And the Russian Air Force claims that in air combat, two other Ukrainian fighter jets one MiG-29 and one MiG Sukhoi-27 were also shot down. Now, this is a direct result of the attempt by the Ukrainians to build up their forces in Kharkiv region and perhaps to undertake an offensive there. They've been attempting to launch airstrikes on the Russians in the area of Kharkiv region. They have... Um, uh, there's been actual pictures of um, Ukrainian aircraft dropping uh, glide bombs, Western-supplied glide 
blood bombs, US supplied and French supplied glide bombs on Russian positions. And it's been widely assumed that the Ukrainians have been undertaking these attacks in order to try to counter the advances of Group of North is Group of Forces North and perhaps also to enable the Ukrainians to launch a counterattack in this area, driving the forces, a group of forces north, back across the border. Well, we see the result. Um, according to the Russians, seven fighter jets, Suhoi 27 fighter jets, probably the sum total of all the Suhoi 27 fighter jets Ukraine still has left, one of the most advanced fighter jets in the world, incidentally, developed by the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s. It still equips large uh, uh, numbers, it's still, it's still present in large numbers in the Russian Air Force, though probably heavily modernized as compared to the Suhoi 27s that the Ukrainian Air Force operates but all of these aircraft systematically destroyed by the russians in airstrikes on the airfields from which they have been operating and um, in air combat as well and the point about air combat brings me back to that discussion that i've made in several programs on that topic which has been completely ignored, as far as I can see, by pretty much every commentator, which is that the Russians are also claiming that they are successfully intercepting and shooting down Patriot air defense missiles after launch. The Ukrainians have been trying to build up defenses um, along the border with Russia in Kharkiv region. They've been forward deploying fighter jets, advanced fighter jets, the most advanced fighter jets that they have to their um, airfields, to Mirnograd, and as we'll see in a moment, to Poltava as well, that they've also um, been trying to launch airstrikes against the Russians. They've been trying, in other words, to gain control of the air over the battlefront in Kharkiv, from the Russians. And what has happened is that the aircraft that they have forward deployed to this area, to this airfield in Mirnograd, the aircraft that they've deployed have been destroyed by the Russians en masse. They're too close to the Russian borders. The Russian drones are able to spot them on the airfields and the Russians are able to attack the airfields almost immediately in real time as soon as the aircraft are spotted. Apparently, in this case, the missile strikes on the airfield were conducted by Iskander-M missiles, though it is quite possible that um, some kind of cruise missiles also participated in this attack on the airbase in Mirnograd. And the Patriot air defense missile systems that have been trying to support and to protect the air bases and to uh, support also the uh, fighter jets, the Ukrainian air fighter jets, they are being shot down in midair by the Russians as well. It seems to me that these two pieces of information, the destruction of the Ukrainian fighter jets and the shooting down of the Patriot air defense missiles are connected. And in the hours that followed, we got further news of another airstrike by the Russians on another air base. This is the one in Poltava. This seems to have been attacking Ukrainian helicopters forward deployed in Poltava, Poltava, important industrial city located just west of Kharkiv. By the way, should Kharkiv ever be captured by the Russians, their next objective, were they to decide to advance westwards, would presumably be Poltava. 
But anyway, the Ukrainians destroyed, uh, deployed helicopters and other aircraft to Poltava Air Base, and they were destroyed there as well. Uh, there's been less information about this airstrike uh, up to now, but we will probably get further information soon. This idea of forward deploying fighter jets, of um, air defense systems like the Patriot, um, to try to take on the Russians so close to the border of, with Russia, as many commentators have pointed out, including, of course, myself, but many others too. It was extremely unwise, incredibly reckless, probably insisted upon by NATO, um, by NATO and by, by uh, the US. And, well, we see the result. Now, it may not be unconnected that there are reports circulating that um, there is now pressure coming from various NATO officials and even US officials to relax the restrictions on use of ATACMS missiles to attack deep inside Russian territory and to target in particular the major Russian air base in Voronezh, which is supposed to be the air base from which the Sukhoi 34s and the other fighter jets uh, some of the other fighter jets that the Russians are deploying in this area are located. And presumably this, these calls are reflections of the complete collapse of Ukrainian air defences in Kharkiv region. Now, since I've started with Kharkiv region, I'm going to continue with the latest report from Group of Forces North, they are providing us with information about what is happening in Kharkiv region. And I will briefly read out what they say. They say that in the Volchansk direction, fighting continues in Volchansk. Um, assault groups, a group of forces north, have occupied one building in the area of the high-rise buildings and are advancing in the southwestern direction with battles. So they are confirming that they have broken into the area of the high-rise buildings and have captured at least one. And it's clear that the entire area of the high-rise buildings has not yet been cleared, but it looks as if the high-rise buildings, the area of the high-rise buildings is now in effect encircled by the Russians and the operation to break Ukrainian defences in the area of the high-rise buildings in northern Volchansk is underway and the Russians also confirm that they are continuing their operation to clear the remaining Ukrainian forces from the loop of the Volcha River to the south of the aggregate plant, which is what this advance in the southwestern direction is all about. And the Group of Forces North goes on to say, given the lack of alternative routes, the enemy continues to move reinforcements across the Volcha River. This is in the area where the Russians are advancing to the loop of the river, and that they lose, according to Group of Forces North, more than half of the personnel in the process. And um, they say the group of forces north says up to 15 enemy troops were killed by artillery fire from the group of forces north's artillery. And um, the article, the report rather from group of forces north then goes on to say over the course of the day we managed to gain a foothold increase the number of personnel and expand the bridgehead to a depth of 50 meters on the left bank of the Seversky Donetsk River near the Bogrovatka settlement. So the Russians have crossed the Seversky Donetsk River. This is not the Volcha River. They've crossed the Seversky Donetsk River in the Volcha, uh, in the Volchansk area and they are starting work on an outflanking operation of the Ukrainian troops in southern Volchansk. That is what this is telling us and 
group of forces north goes on to say the total advance of Russian troops in the Volchansk direction was up to 100 meters. So it looks like the situation is going for in for the Ukrainians in Volchansk is deteriorating, perhaps not fast, but steadily. And the group of forces north also discusses the situation in Lipsy. They say that the situation in Lipsy remains unchanged. The enemy continues to transfer reinforcements in small groups to storm the village of Glubokoy. One, of, one such attempt was thwarted by our artillery. Up to seven enemy troops and two pickup trucks were destroyed. Russian aviation strikes with Fab 1500 bombs destroyed two locations of the 13th Brigade of the Ukrainian National Guard. Enemy losses in Lipsy amounted to up to 70 troops. So the Russians continuing to hold the Ukrainians back in the Lipsy area even as they advance in Volchansk. And then Group of Forces North, as always, provides us with certain comments about the general situation in the Kharkov area. The Ukrainians have switched to the tactic of increasing the number of counterattacks in small groups, hoping to slowly squeeze our defences. For this purpose, they're gradually transferring special forces, um, including the Kraken units and others, to um, the line of contact. This is in Kharkov region. So the Ukrainians are now redeploying special forces units to the area of Kharkov region. And Group of Forces North goes on to say, uh, the Ukrainian command is ready to sacrifice any number of personnel to achieve at least minimal results. At this time, our aviation and artillery are doing their job, destroying the enemy um, and the attack aircraft um, are and, the, and uh, are, are destroying the enemy and our attack aircraft um, uh, and um, assault forces are slowly but surely squeezing the enemy in Volchansk. Victory will be ours. So this is the overall summary of the situation in Kharkov region by Group of Forces North. They're, big, they're gradually pushing the Ukrainians in the area of the high-rise buildings. It looks like the aggregate plant is under their control, though Group of Forces North has not been talking to us about this for some time. They are inflicting heavy losses on the Ukrainians. The Russian Air Force is very active. It has destroyed Ukrainian air defences in Kharkov region, shooting down or destroying on the airfields large numbers of Ukrainian fighter jets. And the situation is becoming critical. And perhaps unsurprisingly, General Sirsky, the overall Ukrainian military commander, has rushed to the area. Um, ideas of counteroffensives, I suspect, have been called off. The situation is going from bad to worse, and there doesn't seem to be very much that General Sirsky or anyone else can do. So that is the situation in Kharkov region. I started with Kharkov region, but it is not there that the most dramatic events are taking place. The most dramatic event um, over the last 36 hours has taken place in Chasovia, because the Russian Defense Ministry has now confirmed that um, the micro-district the area of the micro district west of the canal, uh, or rather of the aqueduct, has now fallen completely under Russian control. The Russians have pushed the Ukrainians out of the micro district. And this is the report from the Russian Defense Ministry. Units of Group of Forces South have completely liberated Norvi district. Uh, this is the micro district of Chasovia locality and improved the situation along the front line. A very bland statement, but there are pictures and photographs of paratroopers of the 98th Brigade of the Russian Airborne Forces flying their flags on the western buildings at the very western tip 
of the micro district. The micro district has now fallen and it is fully under Russian control, even as the Russians um, on the northern flanks of Chasov Yar have cleared the district, the village of Kalinina, advanced all the way north towards the village of Georgievka, have established a long line of control along the aqueduct, have crossed the aqueduct in various places and set up a bridgehead on the northern flanks of Chasov Yar and according to many reports, have also established a bridgehead immediately to the south of Chasov Yar, beyond the aqueduct. Now, some commentators are suggesting that before launching a concerted attack to try to capture Chasov Yar, the Russians are going to first um, clear all the Ukrainian troops to the west of Klesheyevka, um, Ivano, Ivanivka, Ivanivska and Kordyumovka to the south of Chasov Yar. They're going to push the Ukrainians back across the aqueduct, across this entire area. And then the battle, the main battle for the central and western part of Chasov Yar will begin, bringing the, bringing the Russian offensive uh, west to the area west of the canal and of course with the Russians positioned now right along the aqueduct both on the eastern and northern and southern flanks of Chasov Yar and with the Russians controlling the airspace and now starting to deploy aircraft equipped with FAMP 3000 bombs in Chasov Yar as well by the way just saying and with the Russians um, also operating with drones and artillery, intercepting and bombing the main supply roads into Chasov Yar. It looks as if the Battle of Chasov Yar is quickly reaching its culminating point with a strong likelihood that Chasov Yar itself will fully fall, fall fully under Russian control at some point within the next few weeks. And to repeat again a point that has been made by many people, once Chasov Yar falls fully under Russian control, we can say that the last part of this battle, the Battle of Bakhmut, that began in earnest in October 2022, when General Surovikin, at that time the overall Russian commander, um, ordered the Wagner organization to advance on Bakhmut, the Battle of Bakhmut will have finally um, concluded. All of the entire, the entirety of the Bakhmut conurbation will have fallen fully under Russian control. And the next battle, the Battle for Konstantinovka, much bigger place but, uh, than Chasov Yar, but one located on low ground relative to Chasov Yar. The Battle of Konstantinovka will begin. And once Konstantinovka has fallen, and it's difficult to see how uh, Konstantinovka can be defended if Chasov Yar falls, then the final battle for Donbass, the battle for Kramatorsk, will begin in earnest. Now, that's, as I said, perhaps the single most dramatic piece of news uh, we've heard up to now in the fighting in um, the Ukraine on the Ukrainian battlefields since the fall of El Cheretino, which, as I seem to remember, happened, I think, in um, April. I might be getting this wrong, but we've now had a whole succession of major Russian advances of Devka or Cheretino now. Um, Eastern Chasov Yar, the micro district, has fallen. Um, this is, as I said, a major defeat for the Ukrainians, um, bringing forward the end of the Donbass campaign, which is now starting to float within sight beyond the time horizon, on the time horizon. And of course, 
Charles of Yar, perhaps the biggest news um, of the last 36 hours, but also terrible news for the Ukrainians. Elsewhere, um, it looks as if the Russians now uh, have made deeper advances into Toretsk. There's a report that they now control around half of the village of New York, which is, to be clear, part of the Torets conurbation. The Russians, as I said, gradually breaking deeper into Torets. The uh, Redovka newspaper of the uh, Russian newspaper said that there are insufficient Ukrainian troops in Torets to hold the entire fortifications that had been built there. It is looking as if the defences of Toretsk are crumbling and are crumbling at an accelerating, increasing pace. And, well, elsewhere, the news is also very grim for the Ukrainians. I've discussed in many programmes how, um, in my opinion, the single most important part of the battlefronts remains the area of Avdevka and Ochiretino and of the Russian positions, the Russian advance westwards and ultimately northwards towards the road linking Pakrovsk to um, um, Konstantinovka further east and ultimately Chasov Yar itself. And again, we had a lot more news from this area as well. It looks as if the Russians have certainly broken into Novoselivka, Persia, village to the west of Ocheretino. They appear to control the villages of Sokol and Yevgenivka. They're now located, apparently they've now reached um, um, a positions one and a half kilometers west of the village of Progress. Progress is probably the last key village that the Russians need to capture in this area before they uh, resume the advance towards Vozvizhenka, just south of the road from Pakrovsk to Konstantinovka and Chasov Yar. And again, it's important to say that progress, if it falls, will mean that the battle for Pakrovsk itself will have begun. Um, I said that uh, the missile strikes on the airfield at Mirnograd probably were launched using Iskander air missiles from this general area. Mirnograd located close to Pakrovsk itself and if this airbase is indeed is located there. But the point is that with pra Pakrovsk having fallen, the Rus sorry, with progress having fallen, the Russians will be within confident artillery range of Pakrovsk itself. It looks like the defences in this whole area, the Ukrainian defences in this whole area, are collapsing. And we're getting more and more reports that the Ukrainian troops in this area, in the Pakrovsk area, are uh, retreating rather than standing to fight and resist the Russians. And we're also getting reports that there are increasing numbers of surrenders of Ukrainian troops in this area as well. And I mentioned General Sirsky and the fact that he's been rushed uh, northwards to um, Kharkov region to try to stabilize the area there as well. But he's also recently been to Pakrovsk, apparently, and he's provided this rather interesting report. He says that the situation, this is what he's written on his Facebook page, the situation in the Pakrovsk area is still difficult. The intensity of the fighting in other areas has decreased, but the front line has extended. I don't understand what he means by that. But then he goes on to say that the troops in the Pakrovsk area need more munitions, more artillery, in other words, and weapons. In fact, there has been a devastation 
of Ukrainian um, um, equipment in this area. Um, Dima at the Military Summary Channel has been talking about this, that the Ukrainians have lost huge numbers of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and artillery pieces in this area. There's reports um, just coming through that another Abrams tank has been destroyed in this area as well. But anyway, going back to Sirsky, apparently all this destruction is not enough. Still more tanks, infantry fighting vehicles and shells need to be uh, sent to this area, presumably so that the Russians can uh, destroy them. But then he goes on to say that the key problem is to recruit motivated, well-trained soldiers, as well as provide the army with modern electronic warfare and air defense means to counter Russian drones. So we've been hearing lots and lots and lots about the effectiveness of Ukrainian drones. Sirsky is complaining on the contrary that it is the Russian drones that are more effective. The Russians um, clearly are routing the Ukrainians in this area. I do think that is an understatement of the situation. And um, there are no fortified lines to speak of. The, there has been a mass destruction of Ukrainian um, um, infantry fighting vehicles and artillery and tanks. And Sirsky is complaining that the soldiers are not motivated enough, that they're not reliable, that they're not prepared to stand and fight, that they're not the hardened veterans that Ukraine was able to rely on earlier in the war, that they are uh, presumably the recently mobilized soldiers whose heart is not in the fight. And that, it seems to me, is perhaps um, the key point to understand about where we've reached in this war now. Um, in the early weeks of the war, back in 2022, there was a mass enlistment of men into the Ukrainian army. They were the men who had been supporters of the Maidan movement. They were the ones who'd fought in Donbass, continuously from 2024. They were the ones who were um, fiercely supportive of the conception of an independent Ukraine restructured and reorganized along the lines that the Maidan movement wanted. Many of them have fought with extraordinary courage, and I say this notwithstanding my profound disagreement with their ideology. But anyway, they have fought with great courage. But two and a half years of relentless attrition means that those that group of perhaps two or three hundred thousand men who formed the core of the Ukrainian army have been crushed. And the men who are now being mobilized, older men and younger, are no longer drawn from the militants, if you wish, of the Maidan movement. They're from that larger part of the Ukrainian population that was either indifferent or hostile to the Maidan movement and to obje its objectives. And they do not share the motivation and the determination of that earlier cohort of soldiers. And to round off what I am saying, what I'm describing about the situation on the battlefronts, suffice to say that there's now reports that some of the Ukrainian troops who were left behind in Krasnogorovka are now indeed surrounded, exactly as they said that they would be, that the Russians are clearing Krasnogorovka, that the Russians are continuing to advance towards Karlovka. There's a report from the Russians that the Ukrainians are trying to rush reinforcements to Karlovka, where uh, the Ukrainians are seeing their resistance also collapse one way or the other all across the front lines. The situation is terrible. This has been, as I said, the worst day 
Ukraine has suffered. The last 36 hours have been the longest and worst day Ukraine has suffered since the fall of Ocheretino a few weeks ago. And it is perhaps proving to be a decisive moment in the war. And note that all of this is coming on the eve of the NATO summit meeting, which starts in six days. Now, where do we go from here? I spoke yesterday about how Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, has gone to Kiev, where he's had a meeting with President Zelensky. I said that this looked to me like an attempt by Orban to knock some sense into Zelensky. So, in fact, it has proved. It turns out that Orban went to Ukraine trying to persuade Zelensky to announce a unilateral ceasefire, to acknowledge that the war is lost, to announce a unilateral ceasefire, presumably as a preliminary to a general withdrawal of Ukrainian troops for, from the four regions as demanded by President Putin. And predictably, Zelensky has rejected Orban's proposal. And we have this from the deputy head of Zelensky's office, Igor Zhovka. He is reported as saying the following. Um, Orban laid bare his thought. This is not the first country to speak about such possible scenarios. The president heeded his vis-a-vis -vis and shared his position in response. Ukraine's position is quite clear, transparent and well known. The matter is that such processes as a ceasefire cannot be considered in isolation. And Zhovka reiterated that Ukraine's position is that the crisis settlement can only be reached through Ukrainian-initiated peace summits. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, apparently, um, the answer is no. And we have further explanations of why, perhaps, um, in terms of the lines that Zelensky is taking. He continues to say no to all these reasonable proposals, at least to my mind, let's not call them reasonable, rational proposals to sit to opt for a ceasefire. And well, one reason why this is happening is because, of course, he still faces um, intractable opposition from the hardliners who surround him. This is, of course, assuming that he is no longer a hardliner himself. Now, amongst the hardline groups is the reconstituted Azov Brigade. And it looks as if the Azov Brigade has now been significantly expanded. And it looks like it now essentially consists of two brigades. The third assault brigade, about which we've been hearing quite a lot over the last few weeks. And the 12th brigade, which is also apparently made up to a great extent of some of the men who previously surrendered to the Russians at Mariupol and who then uh, were allowed by the Russians to um, go to Turkey under a clear understanding from the Turks that they would not be allowed to return to Russia. Erdogan, as we know, went back on that promise and the men of the Azov Brigade returned to Ukraine where they were reformed in a new brigade where, in my opinion, they are acting in a way that will assist the objectives of the Russian hardliners. Now, this brigade has been conducting some kind of counterattacks in the area of Kremenaya. This is a town in um, uh, the northern front lines, south, I believe, of Kupiansk, but north of Siversk. When Liman fell at the time of the Kharkov, Ukraine's successful Kharkov offensive, there was a lot of talk that if the Ukrainians were able to capture two further towns, west, uh, east of Liman, Svatovo and Kremenaya, then the Russian 
um, communication lines to Donbass would be cut off and the entire special military, a uh, special um, military operation, the entire Russian operation in Ukraine would collapse. I never bought into that theory, but suffice to say, the Ukrainians were never able to capture Svatovo or Kremenaya. Well, of course, since then, the whole situation has completely transformed. The Russians, as we see, are now back in Kharkiv region. They've uh, uh, managed to break through in Shasif Yar. They've made a breakthrough in Torets. They've captured Bakhmut. They've captured Avdeevka. <laughs> They've seen off Ukraine's summer 2023 offensive. Everything has changed since that time. But this brigade, the reconstituted Azov Brigade, is continuing the battle for Kremenoya, uh, gaining a few tree lines here and there, achieving nothing of any significance, perhaps inflating their own successes, but conducting a stream of propaganda directed principally at the Kiev authorities. And first of all, they basically said that they are deeply opposed to Ukraine joining the European Union. This is fundamentally contrary to their um, philosophy, which of course remains the philosophy of the 1930s, which I'm not going to discuss in more detail. So they don't want to be part of the European Union. They have criticized the Ukrainian military command, people like General Soldol, who's um, uh, dismissal they appear to have engineered. They um, are now talking up their own successes on the front lines, successes which are trivial and of no significance. And they are also demanding in the usual demagogic way that such people do, that mobilization now be extended to include the rich and famous in Ukraine. They also need to be rounded up in the gyms and nightclubs and wherever they are and packed off to the front line, where, of course, as soon as they arrive, they will either die or immediately retreat or surrender to the Russians. Anyway, this is what this unit is now saying. Now, of course, it could be that these people believe in much of the propaganda that they are uttering. But I can't help but think that one of the reasons that they are talking in the way that they are is because they sense that the writing is on the wall for Ukraine and for the whole of Project Ukraine, which of course they remain fervently committed to. And their objective is not so much, I think, to achieve all of these objectives. They probably will get General Sirsky sacked at some point. What they want to do is to preserve the flame, to guard the flame of Ukrainian nationalism in its most extreme form as developed by the Maidan movement um, before and after the seizure of power in February 2014. So they are opposed to EU membership. They're already creating a narrative of Ukraine's betrayal by the West. They're already creating a narrative about how Ukraine was betrayed by its senior commanders, by the flaccid and corrupt and weak leadership in Kiev, which is protecting the rich at the expense of the poor. And in these attacks, this offensive that they are, which well, are even an offensive, these attacks that they are creating in this forgotten theatre of the war, which has lost all of its significance, well, they are busy creating their own myth that they who kept to the true path are able to continue the battle, are still fighting on heroically and courageously, um, driving back the Russians, the Moscows, as they're sometimes called by the Ukrainians. They're able to fight and beat them. 
it's all of the others, the um, people who lack their faith and their courage, who um, are losing the war for Ukraine, those who've relied on the West, those who've led the Ukrainian army badly, those who are corrupt, those who are not, as I said, fully committed and dedicated to the struggle. But of course, the, the, the fact that these people exist and that they're behaving in this way is creating problems for Zelensky himself. Because, of course, it's not just Sirsky that these people are going to be critical of. It is Zelensky himself. And, of course, if he does announce some kind of capitulation, as these men of the Azov Brigade will perceive it, if he does announce the kind of ceasefire that Orban is proposing, well, these same men of the Azov Brigade, who once threatened to hang Zelensky on Kreshatik, the major street in Kiev, after he was first elected president, and when he said that he wanted to implement the Minsk agreement. Anyway, Zelensky must fear that the first thing they will do is come after him, and with the Ukrainian army and um, society disorganized and demoralized in the face of defeat, it may be that there will be no real resistance to them. So, anyway, that's a problem which far too few people in the West, it seems to me, want to address, but we see how it is playing out in Ukraine at the present time. Now, I mentioned that the NATO summit meeting is happening. I'm not sure to what extent Western officials, Western governments, fully understand how critical the situation in Ukraine is becoming. The President of the United States is, of course, in a crisis all of his own. Um, there's more reports in the Financial Times this morning of spreading concern about the president's position amongst Democrats. And, of course, it could turn out that the brief stabilisation we saw over the last few days following his disastrous failure at the debate, that that process of stabilisation is now coming to an end. President Macron has to worry about the results of the elections on Sunday. The best outcome that he can achieve now is of an enormously strengthened Rassemblement National in the French Parliament, but one denied a majority and a situation where the French Parliament is not only hung with no party having a majority, but massively divided and therefore unable to provide France with a stable government able to lead France through the crisis that it needs. One way or the other, if Macron decides to stay on, he will turn up at the NATO summit meeting, a diminished and discredited figure. And of course, in Britain, we have elections on Thursday. Everybody expects Prime Minister Starmer to emerge at the other end of the election. But, of course, he will come to the NATO summit meeting as a new Prime Minister um, without perhaps the depth and understanding of the situation that his predecessors have, that what real understanding of the situation Sunak, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss and Boris Johnson had, well, that's another question entirely. Anyway, so NATO summit meeting is coming. Perhaps they don't fully understand how critical the situation in Ukraine actually is. But of course, they do sense, I suspect, that things are not going according to plan. And there's a report in the Daily Telegraph that says that they're going to tell Zelensky that Ukraine is just too corrupt at the moment to join NATO. 
Well, that might be true, but if Ukraine is too corrupt to join NATO, why is it not also too corrupt to join the European Union? It looks to me as if this is essentially telling Zelensky that the whole project of Ukraine joining either the EU or NATO has been put permanently on the shelf. That's at least how it looks to me. Anyway, they're nonetheless going to rush through apparently another $2.3 billion aid package. They're running through the $13.8 billion of aid that was authorized by Congress back in March at phenomenal speed. And what is it achieving? Nothing. And, um, well, there's also, of course, the talk of them allowing the missile strikes on Voronezh, the airfield in Voronezh. All that that will do is infuriate the Russians, but it's not going to change the outcome of the battle. There's no conceivable way that it can. And opinion polls across Europe are now confirming what was already clear after the European Parliament elections. We, and as is, and by and in the first round of the French parliamentary elections, that the European electorates remain strongly opposed to the deployment of European of NATO troops to fight the Russians in Ukraine. We're in an astonishing situation. There have been so many opportunities to end this conflict. I think that the gravity of this crisis now is that in the absence of effective leadership in the West, the president distracted and probably no longer in control of the United States, the president of France in crisis also. The German government, um, deeply unpopular, as I've come to realize in Germany itself, and also on the defensive. The situation in Britain, unclear. There is no one to lead the West to come up with proposals at this time even as the military situation in Ukraine approaches crisis point. I'm starting to think, in fact, I've been worrying for a long time, that if there is a decision now to seek negotiations, there simply isn't figures of authority in the West able to act on that decision in any coherent way, and that this might all have been left too late. Well, we will see. But one way or the other, a dramatic 36 hours in Ukraine, perhaps Ukraine's worst day since the fall of Avdevka, and probably the harbinger of even worse days to come. Well, that's my program today. I think it'll be the penultimate program I've made from Germany, just to say. Thank you all for bearing with me throughout this time. But let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can find still our Football 24 series. And last but not least, if you've liked this program, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.